papers. Partial, of course, because he mainly left the patriarchal family, the economic and sexual relations of domination between husband and wife intact, in addition to a means of creating social cohesion. In contrast, the argument goes, modern socialism seeks the full liberation of women from household labor and is characterized by large-scale industrial labor, which requires large-scale cooperation. Kotsky maintains as follows. What modern socialism aims at is the extension of the social character of work within the individual undertaking to the whole field of production and the adaptation of the mode of appropriation to the mode of production. That is why sociality that is why sociality in this sphere is a point of secondary importance for modern socialism, but a vital condition for more socialism. In this respect, Moore has a closer affinity with the so-called socialistic phenomena of antiquity, above all with platonic communism, than with present-day socialism. This was all Kotsky. In other words, the social nature of production, enabled by the division of labor and the introduction of machinery that brings large groups of workers together, no longer requires everyday experiences of socialization as a source of political identification. The sociality of the workplace and the labor process is such that it no longer needs a commensal supplement. Which brings me to the last part. Perhaps Kotsky is right in pointing to urbanization and industrialization as providing other mechanisms of sociality that account for the eventual neglect of commensality in revolutionary thought. And we know that mainstream political philosophy shifted its concerns to other problems, sovereignty, violence, law, property, rights and obligations, etc. But in accounting for the disavowal of commensality, we could also follow a slightly different track, one that links the disappearance of commensality with the disappearance of the commons. The process of land enclosures, which not only correspond historically with the disappearance of the commensal emphasis, but which also resonate deeply with one another with respect to their shared causes and consequences. We know that the destruction of the commons and the practices of commoning went hand in hand with the early development of capitalism. I suggest that we think commensality as the most ordinary practical form of commoning, a direct extension of using land and the products of land in common, and a transparent reflection of the prevailing social morality and political culture in daily life. An important landmark that becomes symptomatic in how disparate processes come together to pave the way to these dual disappearances is the Magna Carta, the famous charter signed between English barons and King John at Runnymede in 1215. In his brilliant recent book called the Magna Carta Manifesto, Peter Linnebaugh discusses how there were in fact not one, but two charters in the Magna Carta the Charter of Liberties, also known as the Great Charter, and the Charter of the Forest. The first charter acknowledged the basic liberties of free men in England, including habeas corpus, trial by jury, inheritance for widows. It stipulated the prohibition of torture, freedom of travel for merchants, uniform weights and measurements, and the end to unrightful seizures of livestock. The second charter involved the restoration of rights to the forest, disafforestation of areas that have been declared forest, namely their removal from royal jurisdiction. This reflected the rights of the common of the people to the commons, protecting customary access to pastures, stones, wood, fuel, estovers, honey, nuts, mushrooms, herbs, and berries. In other words, it protected the rights of material subsistence of the people by enabling free access to all those areas that were deemed forests, and these involved not only the woods, but also large pastures. The commons, Linnebaugh warns us, should not be construed simply as a natural resource. 
The full meaning of the term suggests, more than anything else, that commons involves the activity of commoning, one that suggests human community and fellowship, not just having access to common pasture. In the decade following their creation, the two charters go through various minor changes, but are reissued and confirmed together in 1225 as the common law of the land. Linabaugh traces how in the subsequent centuries, the Magna Carta is both exalted as an originary document, uh, an originary constitutional document, protecting basic rights and liberties, while at the same time, it is emptied of its radical material content by its severing from the charter of the forest. Historically, the early revolts and rebellions in modern European history all demand the restoration of customary forest rights and protest high prices of bread at the same time. For English revolutionaries such as John Milton, John Lilburn, and other levelers, Jared Winstanley and the Diggers, the Magna Carta is a continuous reference point for appeals to popular sovereignty and justice. However, soon after the revolution, Cromwell, yes, Cromwell, sanctions the enclosure of the forests for the advantage to husbandry and tillage to which all commons are destructive, he says. Later, when the Magna Carta is referenced against the crown by American colonies, the forest charter is also conveniently ignored. Linabaugh claims that Magna Carta became an instrument of both colonial independence and acquisitive empire. Further encroachments on the Magna Carta occur with the sanctioning of the slave trade in 1713. But the Magna Carta still functions as the rallying point for the abolition of slavery and struggles for liberty. A century later, with the Ten Hours Act, when that act is passed, Marx writes in the Capitol, and I'm quoting, in place of the pompous catalog of inalienable rights of man, comes the modest Magna Carta of a legally limited working day." End of quote. From the expropriation of forests in the Rhineland and the removal of common rights to the struggles around the working day, Marx sees a direct, if implicit, thread. However, by and large, the disjuncture between basic liberties and common rights exemplified by the reduction of the Magna Carta to the single charter of liberties is fixed in the theoretical imagination, perhaps even taken for granted. An exception is Kropotkin, who believes that peasant resistance to the enclosures is key to their revolutionization. Linnebau argues, enclosures were not only the Enclosures were not the only force in the creation of the land market, but they destroyed the spiritual claim on the soil and prepared for the proletarianization of the common people, subjecting them to multifaceted labor discipline, the elimination of cakes and ale, the elimination of sports, the shunning of dance, the abolition of festivals, and the strict discipline over the male and female bodies in the competition between commonwealth and commodity, we know all too well which one has won, so far. Just as the charter of the forest drops out of the Magna Carta, it also drops out of the political imaginary and only enters insofar as it is a negative demand for the elimination of private ownership. In the hesitation to provide a positive program, which we find in most revolutionary theory, we can find the greatest evidence of the hegemonic power of the destruction of commoning. This is a movement that documents Arendt's arguments about the rise of the social and the invasion of the political in reverse. What we have here is a progressive constriction of the social by the expansive and dominant juridical conception of the political, one which suffocates the shared life worlds of ordinary people atomizes individuals and sets them free from the land and its products that are shared in common. If the dream of an abundant table becomes the dream of the poor and the destitute, 
This is because not only the food, but also the tables of the people 